welcome to the Born Free podcast, where we'll discuss the challenges facing the world's wildlife and ecosystems. My name's Sarah Locke and I'll be talking to the passionate people doing their bit to try and secure a future where wildlife and humans can peacefully coexist. Welcome to the Born Free podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Chris Draper, our Head of um, Welfare and Captivity at Born Free. So Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been here? I've been with Born Free for 15 years now. Um, I started way back in the mists of time, um, having had a, a brief career in various other animal protection NGOs. Uh, I'd also spent some time working uh, hands-on in, in what was a slightly less than reputable animal sanctuary in the US. Uh, and prior to that, I'd, I'd studied um, a degree in zoology and a master's degree in primatology. Um, so I kind of, for a very long time, wanted to work in uh, wild animal issues and uh, logical conclusion was uh, trying several times to get a job with Born Free and amazing. eventually succeeded. Amazing. Um, I guess, what, so what does your job kind of constitute now? I mean, is there lots of travel to to various places? Yeah, fair amount of travel. It's not as glamorous as it might be perceived. It's things like meeting rooms and conference centres far more than it is actually seeing animals. Um, it's miserable animals yeah. more often than not as well um so i yeah we we i have responsibility for our sanctuaries in uh, ethiopia in south africa and in india and um that necessitates us to to you know go and visit and keep keep things ticking over there and while i'm i'm also traveling around i'm also looking at captive animal facilities such as zoos uh, and similar similar facilities uh, around the world um seeing what what conditions currently are and what we can do about them yeah so am i right in thinking that you went to south korea in january yes i did how was that yeah i was um it's very interesting uh quite illuminating bit depressing in some ways i was invited to um present to in in the south korean assembly which is the parliament um they were discussing the issues of whether or not zoos should be licensed um they currently have a system where zoos simply just register themselves with the government and there's no real oversight or, or inspection of, of zoos. And we have a long history of doing the opposite in the UK where we've licensed and inspection zoos. It, it license and inspect zoos and I've I've been following that for some time. So basically just trying to give them a bit of the benefit of our experience from the UK. At the same time, I took the opportunity to visit something called an indoor zoo. Uh, which is as bad as it sounds. It's wild animals, anything from short clawed otters, uh, lots of parrots, uh, toucans, etc. In what can only really be described as a sort of shopping centre. Yeah, I was just going to say I've seen kind of horrible yeah. pictures and videos on YouTube and stuff yeah. of of like is that is that what it is like polar bears in? It's not quite as bad as the polar bear example. You're thinking, yeah. I mean, not at this particular one I went to, but it's exactly that. There's oh, no God. natural light. It's indoors. Uh, and it seems to be a f something that's becoming sadly a bit popular in certainly in Asia. Um, and yeah, it was it was an eye opener. We don't have anything quite that awful in the UK, but you know, there's different degrees of awfulness, to be honest. Sure. And I mean, in the UK, I mean, I read that there's still I mean, last year, I think I was about a million people went to London Zoo and Chester Zoo. I mean, that's still so popular. Yeah. Um, what would I mean, what would you say to the proponents of the kind of captivity for conservation argument? What would you say to that? Well, it's it's multifaceted. It's, it's not a simple thing. Um, the bottom line is people go to zoos, not necessarily because they're zoos. I, I say this as, as a father of two young children. Finding things to do with kids is a challenge. Going to a zoo gives you access to somewhere where there's almost certainly fences so the kids can't get run over. There's going to be a cafe. There's going to be a playground. There's going to be, uh, you know, toilets and a changing baby changing facilities. It's an easy thing to take the family to. That doesn't mean that people are visiting because they desperately believe in the claims that zoos are making about conservation, or nor are they visiting because, oh, wow, this is going to be so educational, I'm going to become a conservationist. People are visiting because it's a relatively cheap way of filling time, and maybe the kids get to see an animal or two. 
That's so true. I guess I've never really thought of it in that way. Like, obviously, I don't have kids, and I've never thought. It's just easy. But that that is, I think, a, a huge part of how zoos are maintaining visitor numbers. Um, it's if you look into the the motivations of people for visiting zoos, it's it's of course it's easy for people to say yes or oh, yes. I want to learn. How much do they learn? How much do they walk away from re- retaining? How much do they then change their behaviour in relation to animals? And there's been some really interesting studies, one done under the auspices of the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, um, which looked at behaviour change following zoo visits, self-declared behaviour change following zoo visits. So basically what people said they did. And this was a really big study. One of the things that didn't change significantly was people's attitudes and behaviours towards animals. So you go to a zoo and you do not change your attitude or behaviour towards animals. Another one was attitudes and behaviours towards conservation didn't change. One of the few things that did change for the positive was attitudes and behaviours towards recycling. And I would argue that if the only or one of the few net benefits of visiting a zoo is to learn about recycling, something's deeply wrong. Yeah, that is so interesting. And I guess as well, especially in the day of the days that we have where we have these amazing natural history programs, obviously, we've got the David Attenboroughs and the Virginias of the world. And what I mean, I don't think I can't remember the last time I spoke to someone said, how come you're in wildlife conservation? They said, oh, it's because I, I saw penguins at whatever zoo or I saw a polar bear in a concrete pen. I feel like so many people nowadays are kind of like spurred on by the our planets or whatever of the world. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I I do what I do despite zoos. Yeah. Um, I think there's the the old, but I think quite nice ad, adage about when I was young, I went to zoos because I love animals. Um, and now I'm older, I don't go to zoos because I love animals. And I think that's very fitting. No, definitely. Um, and I guess another topic that I wanted to talk about, which I guess is super important for you and, and, and your team in the captive industry is the exotic pet trade and our, our kind of desire to not only visit zoos in captivity, but also have our own. Um, yep. What kind of species are we talking about? You name it. Um, pretty much, even in this country, in, in the UK, uh, you you would be surprised at the diversity of species that are currently owned as pets in private hands. Um, and that's legal it's right? legal it's there is nothing subject to the right paperwork there is nothing preventing anybody owning any species of animal yes yeah, so i looked um and i saw so on born free's website we have an interactive map that you and your team have put together and i mean there's some crazy numbers so we've got i think six clouded leopard in cornwall yep. i mean that seems crazy and yep. it is i mean how can pro- someone properly look after an animal like that i mean are we really talking about in their back garden or in many cases it's it's exactly that it's back garden or worse in some case you know for some of these species it's in the house um the legislation that governs most of these animals that we've listed on that on that map is based around whether or not they pose a risk to the public it's not to protect their welfare it's not even to protect the safety of the owner it's to stop the animals, to ensure that the animals don't get out and hurt somebody. So that basically means that if I've got the right endangered species permits, I can have a tiger in my backyard. The welfare requirements are entirely subjective and dependent on who inspects me. And they may think, just as came up recently in a case relating to two lions, that a 400 square meter enclosure, 40 by 10, is actually big not too big, but big enough for two lions. That is crazy. And that I can, you know, in theory, I would be able to go in because I'm the owner. As long as the animals are held security, I, uh, securely, I can go in, play with them. I can take my kids in, play with the kids and my tiger or lion, whatever it is. That would be entirely within the law as long as those animals don't get out. Oh, my God. So what about the regulation? I mean, so do people... Is this quite heavily regulated? So do people come round and they visit you and your tiger? Or? Once every two years. Every two years. That's that's crazy. Mm-hmm. And I mean, so do you think is this is this kind of like a recent development? Do you think, no. or is this just something that because there are a few more rules, it's something that we are a bit more aware of? No, I mean, or? there's obviously go back in history. There's been a tendency for people to collect exotic animals to you know as a status symbol as a. Um, and matter of interest um it hasn't gone away at all in recent years um i would say that the regulations that are in place 
do little to diminish the demand. And perhaps it, all it's all that's really happened is things shift and they sort of ebb and flow with fashion. So you get spikes in desire to own things like meerkats in response to TV adverts for insurance featuring meerkats. You get um, people trying to breed ex uh, very exotic uh, color morphs of reptiles. So it's not not sufficient to have a boa constrictor. You've got to have a, a rare one. A, well, a, an albino, some sort of you know leucistic form of it. None of this benefits the animals and all of them are being bred for a trade to be kept in a domestic environment where these animals will not thrive. Yeah. And where are people getting those animals from? Is that, I mean, can, can you just buy that online? I mean, it's astonishing what's out there of, to, to pick up online in terms of overt trade. The minute you go digging into things like the dark web and what have you, you can get your hands on whatever you like. No, um, I you know, there's still pet shops, high street pet shops in this country that will, if they don't have one in stock, they will source you a primate. So that shows you, and that's legal. That's the starting point. Um, we're talking marmosets, so generally smaller primates, but uh, it wasn't that many years ago. I was in Northern Ireland, and, and I could have, for I think it was a few thousand pounds, gone pretty much gone home that evening with a, with a macaque. Oh, it's just crazy. Um, so I guess this is quite a key question. What would you say to someone if they were thinking of buying an animal like that? How would you dissuade uh, how them would if I you do could? It politely or yeah, no, politely. <laughs> but dinner, t dinner party. Dinner party. Uh, oh, yeah, dinner worst party. Example. Okay, okay. Um, sorry. No, I would. I would say um, I'd ask. I'd question their 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 wisdom. I'd question their sanity. Sure. Perhaps I would strongly advise them to not look at the availability of the animal as any indicator of their suitability as a pet. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, ask them to explain to me what they think that animal does in the wild, what its habitat is, what its temperature might be, what its diet consists of, where they will get it veterinary treatment should it uh, become unwell. Um, uh, you know, ask them what what sort of enclosure they would be looking to keep it in, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'd I'd wind, I'd wear them down to be yeah. honest. I'm pretty you sure, just keep but going. Uh, keep going. Um, like as well, I guess the social side yeah, of it as well. That's the thing. I mean, you're just going to have one, a solitary primate. You're going to have two of something that and enforce them to live alongside each other, even though they don't get along. You know, what what are the the fallback options? What happens if you get sick? What happens? You know, any number of things. We all know. I think many of us have have domesticated animals as pets, and we all know the enormous responsibility that comes with that and we all I, I suspect know how people often let animals down I mean there's there's great statistics showing the number of dogs that are left at home all day while people are at work for a, for a very social animal like dogs that's that's actually genuinely quite cruel I, but we all do it it's it's sort of socially the norm um that shows how we treat animals that we th all think we know how to look after goodness knows what we would be doing either over uh, inadvertently or, or, or deliberately to animals that we don't have the same knowledge of, of what they need no that's 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 really true and quite a few things that i probably hadn't thought about um and i shall add them to my arguments next time that's i'm splendid. at a dinner party <laughs> um and i think you did just touch on that you earlier about the illegal pet trade i guess that we're talking about the ones that you're allowed to but what about the illegal pet trade and in particular um the four little lion cubs uh that that we're currently fundraising for can you tell us a little bit exactly i mean for, for any Example I just gave of, of cases where animals being kept legally. I think there's, there's multitude times more being kept illegally, not just obviously in the UK, but globally. You've got enormous uh, global trade in live animals for illegal pet as illegal pets. Um, in the Middle East, there's been a recent upsurge apparently in the um, uh, desire to keep big cats as pets as a status symbol to emulate what you know the sort of things that that people see sadly uh on on social media you know uh music videos you name it there, there's still this desire and animals are being sourced directly from the wild to fulfill that demand um though that is a feature of, of life or has been a feature of life in the middle east what's particularly distressing is to realize that the same desires are in place in close to home um, and these four lion cubs that we're talking about all came separately from the illegal trade in France um, within the space of I think it was a month or so they were found and, and confiscated one of whom 
was even found and reported to the authorities in the back of a Lamborghini on the Champs Elysees. Um, what more ridiculous scenario can you create for a wild animal? And, and not just a wild animal, but a very young and uh, dependent young animal like a lion cub. Um, and rightfully, the authorities acted. But the simple fact is that there were four within the space of a few weeks. There's more out there. We suspect there's um, a link to the circus industry. Um, and we strongly suspect that um, circuses are supplementing their income in those countries where, where that is still permitted, such as France, Germany, Italy uh, and Spain that it's it's actually relatively easy to get animal, big cats to breed. And if you can sell the offspring for a few thousand pounds, so much the better. The quicker you sell them, the more likely the, the mother is to get back into season and start be able to breed again. So um, it's a good source of income. And people are either stupid or naive and trying to emulate people they've seen on, on YouTube or whatever. Yeah, so, I mean, that naivety, what, what happens to the lions? I mean, obviously, in these cases, they've been rescued, but what would normally happen, or not normally, but what would happen if they hadn't been found? I mean, and they get they grow to the size of an actual lion. Then well, what happens? I mean, even in cases where they have been found, what you're dealing with is abject cruelty. You've got issues relating to... These animals are never given the appropriate diet. Um, so you get, you're going to get nutritional issues that lead to problems with bones, problems with eyes, problems with nerves and balance and things like that. And we've seen this time and time again with our animals that we've rescued over the years, where they are, even as adults, they are just not necessarily healthy animals because of their appalling start in life. The, But say these people manage to get, you know, get these animals through the very vulnerable first stages of life, you're dealing with an animal that's going to grow very quickly. It's going to have no fear of humans at all. And it's going to become equipped with very big claws, very sharp teeth, very quick reflexes, and a lot of muscle strength. And it's going to hurt you or somebody else without a doubt. Um, I once, just as, a, as, a, as an aside, I used to work at, at a facility where I looked after, amongst many other animals, a, a mountain lion who had um, been trained, because he'd been bought as a pet, as a cub, he was then trained when he became unhandleable. He got trained as a, as a like a guard dog would, you okay. know, with those with those suits. So the person that's, you know, that had him realised they couldn't keep him as a pet, but they kept him on a used car lot as a, as a form of security. This is a mountain lion. Um, he was behaviourally, he was utterly fixated on humans, loved humans, but the slightest trigger, you did the wrong thing. He was on you like a shot. Oh, God. Um, or wanted to be on you like a shot. The power in that those animals is, is absolutely immense. And what invariably happens, if, they, if they're not discovered and they're not kept in the right facilities, is that they either, su either suffer mentally themselves or they hurt somebody, or worse, they get out and hurt somebody, or and are shot. Have or something to be, like you that. have to yeah. be shot, yeah. ultimately. And it's it's never a happy ending for these animals. No, no. Um, and what kind of condition were they found in? I mean, I think what's really important here is that they were all unrelated. You know, yeah. these are not related. Four it's separate not. instances. Um, sh and again, I suspect it's tip of the iceberg. Um, none of them were in good health. One of them in particular was a very young female who... Uh, came with a, a whole host of problems, skin problems, eye problems, um, you know, ga gastrointestinal problems. Um, they, they've they been confiscated and placed in a rescue centre where they're receiving the best uh, veterinary care possible um, under the circumstances. They're now doing so much better, but you have to remember where they are now is a temporary place. It can't stay there forever. They're getting bigger by the day. And what we are looking to do is move them to our dedicated sanctuary at Shamwari Game Reserve, uh, where they'll live out the rest of their lives under our care in what are large, naturally vegetated enclosures under the African sun. Well, wow, okay, so that's, that's in South Africa. And when are we, when, are, are you going with them on this trip? I will be going you... with them, yep. Um, so we're moving them next month. And, uh, you know, the important point to stress is that these are a lucky four. Um, they're not... We can't save all of them. What we need to do by doing this, the move of these four is make the case 
to the authorities, to the public, to anyone that will listen, that by doing this move, it's to demonstrate the problem. Obviously, those four get a, a good life. But even then, it's, it's, not a, it's not the life they deserve. It's still captivity. It's still captivity in our care, which we hope is really good, but it's a compromise. Um, and what needs to happen is the trade needs to be sh shut off at source. And if that means stopping the use of wild animals in traveling circuses, that's absolutely the right thing that should happen. If that means stopping private ownership of in a domestic environment of these sorts of animals, absolutely, that's what should happen. Um, there needs to be stronger disincentives, stronger uh, enforcement on these sorts of activities. I mean, you, you know, it's already illegal in France, yeah. but clearly it's going on. So we're going to put our efforts into not just looking after these four cubs, but also ensuring that the... Um, the industry that, that they came from is, is brought to an end. Yeah, and I guess like raising awareness as well, people need to realize, I mean, I never know, the, I mean, is it just that people don't realize quite how detrimental that is to an individual animal? You know, is it that people genuinely don't know? I think that's part of it. I think pe some people don't care, uh, which is quite sad. Um, and I think some people think they are experts when they're not. And, and, a, and a little learning is a dangerous thing. People are emulating people they see online. Um, and then there's also, also this aspirational thing. I mean, a, a number of high profile um, brands will use these animals in their advertising, showing beautiful women, beautiful men, whatever it is, with a, a, a cat on a lead or whatever it is. Or like celebrities. You yeah. see so many of yeah. that on Instagram. And I you won't know, name any yeah, of them. No, but yes, I wasn't gonna go. they've all, they've all, many of them are guilty of doing this. Um, sure. Yeah. And it's it becomes an aspirational thing. And I think people disconnect from the fact that this is a living, sentient thing that they're talking about taking on responsibility for. And in doing so are basically crippling the chances of that animal having a good life. Yeah. And then you end up with sad stories because I, I know that you said it as well. But I mean, this is a sad story. Ultimately, we're not we're not doing the best thing. It'll never be the best thing for no, these. As soon as you take them out, as soon as you yep. take them out of the world, it, their their life is, is essentially compromised. Yep. Um, so yeah, I mean, you touched on it. So moving forward, yeah, basically it needs to be a global effort essentially, isn't it? To it, It's it's a global problem. Um, it, how to tackle it on a global scale is very difficult when there are differences in constituencies and laws, legal systems and, and efforts and, you know, concern. But um you know, things are changing. People are beginning to question the use of animals in these exploitative industries. I, mean, I mentioned circuses. There is an increasing list of countries that uh, have banned wild animals in circuses. Um, England is on the cusp. Scotland's already done it. Wales has just announced that it's going to do it. So that will mean that within, I think, within the next 12 months, um, there will be no uh, traveling circuses with wild animals in Great Britain. Uh, the Republic of Ireland's done it uh, a year or two ago. So basically the British Isles are now free of travelling circuses. So stuff's happening. It's just happening all too slow. It's just step by step. Yeah. Step by step. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Chris. And as That's you touched upon, there are so many more things that we could talk about. And I'm sure we'll get you and your team on, on again. Um, but I just wanted to wrap up with two questions that we ask every guest. Um, number one, um, was there a defining moment for you that you can remember where, where wildlife and its conservation really started to matter? I would say not one moment. I think a, a confluence of, of things um, as simple as uh, having, having a pond in my garden growing up got me interested in, in the natural world, amongst other things. Um, interested in animals. It came, came very much from, from having a dog as well growing up. Um, I, I wasn't, it wasn't motivated by visiting zoos. It wasn't motivated by going on safari. I wasn't so lucky. It was being aware of what's out there on my doorstep living in Southern England, nothing exotic. Um, and yeah, so a, a gradual accumulation of interest and knowledge from there. Um, a, a sort of fascination with the natural world, not one defining 
you know, getting like, knocked over by a rhino when I was three kind of thing. No, nothing like that. No, I Nothing love that. so exciting. exciting. No, that's yeah. great. Did you used to go pond dipping? I did. Yeah, I awesome. spent far too much of my time in ponds. Yes. Yeah. No, I used to love that. Um, okay. And the other one is if, if there's one thing that you could change um, for the, you know, for our planet or a species or yeah, what, what, what would it be for the greater good, I guess? In relation to wild animals, animals in general, our future... Um, I think if there was a magic wand that I could wave that gives everybody, regardless of their background, regardless regardless of, of their geography, um, a bit more of an understanding, a bit more of a of a, an empathy with individual animals, I think that would make an enormous difference to how we treat animals and, by extension, wildlife, whatever you want to call it, natural resources. It's not a very pleasant term. Uh, our planet, what you know, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, if we could magic everyone to care about individual animals, their suffering, their capacity for suffering, um, I think we'd see ourselves in a much, much better state. Ah, oh, thanks, Chris. What a nice way to wrap up. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Born Free podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the episodes, follow us on social media, or head to our website, bornfree.org.uk. My name's Sarah Locke, and our producer's Philip Fortuna. See you next time.